name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Most loving and affectionate Father, you have called each one of us. And in that call, you have given to each one of us our proper vocation in life. Help us to know this call. Help us to recognize it deep within our own soul, for it is already within us. It has been with us from the moment we were baptized. Grant us the grace and the fortitude to embrace that call, and never to run from it, but always toward it. We ask this through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Mother of Divine Grace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, in the heart of every Christian, we move in this way. There are those who are deaf to Christ's call, and maybe even we were at one time. I know I went through that where I seem to be deaf to Christ's call. But then there's the Christian commitment. But that Christian commitment must move up to distinguished service, which means we act deliberately against sensuality, carnal love, and worldly love. And this moves us to the greater offerings that we give to God in and through and with our vocation. Now, we realize that in Pope Paul's encyclical years ago, when he was Pope, his vision was that the world would be converted by the year 2000, the second millennium. That's what he really believed. He, it's right in his encyclical. And this is what we call magnanimity, greatness of soul. Expecting the greatest result. In fact, our prayer should be magnanimous. Because if I pray for one person, they receive a certain amount of grace. If I pray for 10 persons, they each receive the same grace of the one. So in other words, the grace that I pray for is not divided up among 10 people, but each one of them receive the full grace for which I pray. So therefore, God has magnanimity with regard to the little that we do. Now, in 1 Timothy, we see the salvation of all men. And this is through the Roman Catholic Church. Therefore, we contemplate the call of the apostles on whom we as a church are built. We contemplate Jesus picking the 12. Just a wonderful thing. You know, the story is simple. That's, everything is simple with Jesus. He says, all right. He picks certain men who would learn, be his disciples. Now, a disciple is different than a teacher. A teacher and a student, a student usually echoes back, where a disciple envelops, he, he, he becomes one with the knowledge. That's what the, um, the great Greek scholars would do. You became a disciple. And why? Because it became yours. It wasn't the teacher's any longer. Once the teacher imparted to you something, he made you find the rest of it on your own. He didn't give you all the answers. And that's why Jesus speaks in parables a lot. and He, he tells stories. and he, he wants them to get it on their own so it will truly be theirs. In catechetics, it is good to have people echo things back. I think we should do that more. I think we should get back to that, you know, remorization and things like that. They went against that for a while, but eh, that was a flop. In, now, we find that Jesus decides to build his kingdom upon these men, these 12. And we see he looks and he seeks out individuals. He retires to Genezareth, and many followed him. They had an ingenious way of finding out where Jesus was all the time. He was bothered because of the rejection he received in Jerusalem. He went to pray, and in the morning he had the answer that he would build his kingdom not on these men that existed in power, the priests and the scribes, but on these twelve. Simon, Peter, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, James, Thaddeus, Simon, the Zealot, Judas, the Iscariot, the Traitor. 
They identify Judas as the traitor from the very start of Scripture. Did our Lord choose him to show his love for sinners? That doesn't click, really. But it wouldn't be surprising if it were the case. He would build his kingdom on them. And then he gives his manifesto, the Sermon on the Mount, the great manifesto of Christ. A mystery is a thing that is hidden, a meaning, that only faith can see. Now, when we look at the church, we see that Christ established it on these men. We have Christ, and his kingdom is based on this. Peter, the apostles, the disciples, and the followers. We have the pope, the bishop, the pastors, and the laity to teach, govern, and sanctify all men, and that is what we call the church. This is the operation you and I, all of us, are engaged in toward the conversion of all mankind to Christ. And we're all called to assist the bishop in a threefold duty. First, to teach the deposit of faith. Second, to assist in government, governing of souls. And third, to sanctify through the sacramental system. The laity helps now in this sanctification after the council. The church is all of us, laity and religious. We're out for the whole world. Now, the world consists of this. Church is all of us. But the world is political, economic, religious, social, and intellectual. That's the world. The only price by which we can conquer the entire world is to suffer with Christ, whatever it might be. Paul says, pray for your government. The government holds the devil in check, or should. Economics, they're motivated by profit. Service at a profit. The exercises of justice and service today is economic. How to exercise our charity, how to get food where it is needed, and so forth. Fourth, the religious aspect is a mess. Bring about one fold, one shepherd. Eventually we will do it. It is a social, society is social, but the church is social too. In the intellectual world, philosophy and science, one who uses his intellect to better mankind, to develop men who can influence the world with philosophical books, with teachings that will make men better. Sermon on the Mount is probably the most beautiful thing because it begins in the Mount and ends on the Mount of Calvary. St. Francis of Assisi lived the Sermon on the Mount perfectly. It has only one message, poverty of spirit. Now a news article will say first, the sentence will say what happened. Second, the summary of what happens. Third, it gives details in order of importance. So here we have blessed are the poor in spirit. Francis always had that. Francis wrote new rule, and it sounded like the Sermon on the Mount. And every time he tried to write a rule, it sounded exactly like the Sermon on the Mount. The two mountains, Calvary and the Beatitudes. The Sermon on the Mount, he tells us, Calvary, he shows us. You can't ever understand the Sermon on the Mount unless you know the passion of Christ. Jesus has this knock-down, drag-out fight with authority. So realizing that he can't found his church on the 12 tribes, therefore, he gives this manifesto, which is the Sermon on the Mount. If only I could react to all as Christ, to everything that surrounds me on the news and the radio, I have a lifetime of work ahead of me to get the, that which I must organize in my life to be for Christ. Now, we have two things, the world and Christ. We have this. Christ teaches, blessed are the poor, meek, 
those who mourn, those who hunger, those who are merciful, the clean of heart, the peacemakers, and the persecuted. Now, the world says, no, no. It's completely the opposite. Blessed are the rich. Blessed are the dominant, the carefree, the proud, the winners, the luxurious, the fighters, the honored. There's the dichotomy. And Christ says, says give all to who asks. Don't resist evil. Love your enemies. No contest. I must have in me this self-emptying Jesus, the Jesus crucified. This Jesus must be my all. Do I really like the world? Jesus call asks us to be meek, how often would I give in to people who are demanding? And I would say, don't give in when they went on strike. Don't give in. Hold up. Preach modesty once and see how far you get. Or rebel. Prize fighters, when you're looking at a fight, I never why. I couldn't stand it. Prize fight. In fact, I had a debate with my morals teacher who was a chaplain for the boxing community. He was our morals teacher and at the Angelicum and, and I raised my hand and I said, Father, based on what you taught us, uh, it's immoral. Boxing is immoral. And he says, well, you, so, you really think so, huh? So we're going to have a debate and we're going to open it to the school. And so we did have a debate, him and me. And I said, Father, based on what you teach us, us, you have taught us, good must be done, evil must be avoided. The direct effect of boxing is to hurt the other person. That's the first and foremost intention. And therefore, in itself, it is immoral. You cannot do it, and you are the one who taught us that. Well, he gave in. He says, you're right, it is immoral, but I love it. but at least he admitted it was immoral. Because I said, listen, I can hear the people saying, kill him, beat him in, crack, crack, crack his head open. That is not a direct good. How can I get the poor Christ, the mourning Christ, the hungering Christ into me? The biggest help against intemperance is to ask yourself, oh, Lord Jesus, did you eat too much? Do not resist evil. Not one move of defense in the passion did Jesus make. Not once. A crown of thorns. A substantial piece of firewood in his hand. They take it from him, beat him over the head with it. Then he holds it for the next one. 400 men were a cohort. Do not resist evil, Jesus says. This presents problems. Just take it. That's what Jesus teaches. Just take it. Don't resist evil. He was spit upon, slapped, struck. Love your enemies. Sure. But did you ever try? Thank God that we are not required to like them. We have to love them. We don't have to like them. Liking and loving are two different things. I never have to like my enemies. If I did, I'd be schizophrenic. So we have to love our enemies because it's an act of the will. I will to love, therefore I love. No contest. If somebody wants something, give it to them. If one steals from you, it's just a thing. Give them the rest of it. Who cares? There is a primacy with regard to the law of charity. When there is a question of a human law contradicted by charity, charity must prevail. Now, this is important. This is what a law is. A law is an ordination of right reason for the common good properly promulgated by due authority. Now, 
this definition alone would invalidate the abortion laws in this country. Just this, by this definition, which is the definition of a law. Now, but, the big but, ordinary situations, there's no problem. Observe the law. But in extraordinary situations, uncovered situations, unclear law, doubtful applications of law, we invoke epikaia, which goes beyond the law but never against it. And there are four kinds of justice, therefore. Communitive justice, justice we have amongst to each other. Distributive justice, justice to see to it that justice is made so that people get what they need. Legal justice, what is right is right, what is wrong is wrong. People have rights. And epikaia. The goal is always to find the true meaning and purpose of the law and follow it. If it is understood and loved, then it is good. We invoke epikaia. If it is beyond this legal justice, and it isn't according to charity, I must go beyond the law and invoke epikaia, because every law has to have as its basis charity or love. A rule that says one can't go home if they're in a religious cloister. Some people, they say, well, let's dispense the rule for charity's sake. Now, why did they make the rule? You stop and say, okay, what was the intention of the lawgiver when they said that you could not go home? The intention of the lawgiver was this. It was extraordinarily dangerous for nuns and monks to exit the monastery because there were roving bands of bandits all over the world. There was no legal, real true legal system. And so they created a law, stay home, don't go out. You can't go home and visit your family. Let your family come and visit you. Why? Because they, were, they, they had to protect those people who were in, in the monasteries. And now it's a different situation. You can get in a car and you can drive someplace and go there. And so now they invoke Epikaia with regard to what was the intention of the original law, and now that's opened up a little bit. Now you can go overboard with that too. Jesus had a problem because the Pharisees refused to recognize the charity of the law, Epikaia. If I love God, I will adore revere, worship him. I will have true piety. I will live a sacred life. I will engage in holy sex. I will be just. I will be truthful. I will be pure and I will be detached. If I love, I obey. You don't do away with rules. You just develop your love. I got to find and know the Jesus Christ that I have within me, him and him crucified. I boast in him, according to Paul, the great motivation and steadier in my life. One who seeks Christ crucified and his sufferings, he will never be disappointed in whatever vocation he or she chooses. I have traveled personally all over the world. And in every parish, they said, oh, you need to be a sensitivity training because here in Brazil, it's a different mentality. And, and here in Italy, it's in Canada, in, in Spain, in, in Portugal. Idiot. Every single person is yearning for Christ and him crucified. I have never preached anything different anywhere in the world. And the church is filled because I wasn't politically correct. I wasn't bending over and trying to pretend that the laws of God did not exist or that people were different somehow in their need for salvation and Christ crucified and the knowledge of Christ crucified. What will be each one of our lives? What will be that life program for the years ahead? There must be something in each one of you. It has God has called you here. And he's developing these things in you all these years. Not one minute of your life, no matter what you've done, has been wasted. For God does nothing for nothing. 
I think I've said before, you should have a policy rather than a resolution. A policy can have an exception, but a resolution does not. Even a retreat. So many people make resolutions. Oh, I'm going to resolve. I'm going to get up every single day. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Make a policy. Resolutions could destroy the whole fruit of an eight-day retreat or a 30-day retreat or whatever you do. There was once a nun, and she wanted to be aware of Christ, so she resolves during her 30-day retreat to make one hour every single morning to mental prayer before Mass. That means she had to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning. September she does it, October she does it, November she does it. Every month it seems to be getting better all the time. But on December 3rd, she gets a bad cold and has to stay in bed for three days. She got sick doing it. She ran herself down. So the next week, she allowed half time. And the third week, oh, she did it in the afternoon because she couldn't really get up in the morning. Oh, well, it was nice while it lasted. And up in the air goes the entire retreat. Never make a resolution. If she would have said, now listen, I'm going to work out a policy of prayer and work on it day by day. It's a spirit, not an exact practice. It's something we have to understand in our spiritual life. You know, people who are fanatical will become slaves to a program or an orario, and it's never the way God works because the whole purpose of prayer is to fall in love, not to be a slave of the prayer. Prayer is to lift our minds and our hearts to God. And if it becomes a burden, it does the opposite in our spiritual life. And now it works for her. 4 a.m. on this policy, she gets a cold, but she doesn't break the policy. She just says, how should one pray when they're sick? All right, I'm going to lay here like a lump. I'll look at the crucifix on the wall, and that's my prayer, because that's all I've got the strength to do. And so she prays while she's sick. She adapts it. It's a policy, but she's still following it. And that's what every one of us should do, every one of us. Looking over our past thoughts and contemplations, what do we find comes up over and over again? Summarize that in the form of a prayer or saying, and put it in your breviary or in your prayer book. What should I do for my policy? Something I can carry out day by day. In a directed retreat, our primary work is to help get the retreatant in contact with God. That's all it is. In contact with God. Now Jesus goes up incognito to the temple and listens. He knows things. He's the Messiah. Some of the people don't like him, the Pharisees persecuting his disciples and so forth. We are actually betting on the second coming of Christ, all of us, even the Jews now. Missed him the first time around, God bless him. They didn't really want the suffering servant, the one who would be a leper, because they really wanted to be freed from the yoke of Rome and and so they, they, they didn't really want that Messiah, but actually Catholics and Jews, we are all waiting for the exact same second coming. For them it'll be the first, well, kind of the first. Now, mortification and self-denial and renunciation are the three kinds of humility. You see here, we start at the bottom, and we have all these vices, for example, and mortification, uh, such as po is poverty of spirit, that what it does is it, it, it's so that I'm not too attached to something or not attached to it. It kind of gives me an equilibrium, a balance. And so all of this in the bottom, the practicing of the virtues, mortification, which gets me back in shape, 
deals with my sinful, sinfulness and my sins. I want to get back in shape. I want to rise up from that. Well, in the second form is a higher degree of detachment and self-denial. And there, we start dealing with the optionals, all these things that aren't necessary. I mean, reading, sleeping, walking, music, all these things I can do, but I want what God wants me to do. And so I move up higher. When I make it my whole ambition to please God, that's what's called self-denial. And so now I move up and then become what Jesus uses the term, renounced. I don't consider sleeping or walking or reading. Only God. I'm completely renounced. I've separated myself from all the junk of the world. And I don't want it. anything else but God. No other alternatives. That is the highest degree. There, by God becomes my all. Self-renunciation. As far as I'm concerned, I don't exist. If you can get up to that point, then everything becomes something almost simpler. It's a simpler kind of love. Mortifications become a movement of love. The only reason you're here in this room now is because God has wants you here. Every single thing that we heard on the Sermon on the Mount is a promise. All is fulfillment. We don't do it for that purpose, but because it's nice to know it's there. I serve him because I'm a son, a child, a daughter, a child of the family. About two weeks before, Jesus sends all of his disciples on a mission to the city where he will come. And there is a miracle there that he's teaching them. He says, listen, I don't want you to bring any money or clothes or food. Anything. And two weeks, I'll meet you near the synagogue. Okay? Well, they were all enthusiastic, you know. And they go out and rejoice. And he come back and he says, I rejoice more because your names are written in heaven in the book of life. But it was only a year and a half later that Jesus pointed out the miracle that he gave, did for them. He said, listen, when you went out on that mission, remember a year and a half ago? Did you want for anything whatsoever? They look at me and say, no, our clothes didn't get dirty. We never got hungry. He says, you see, trust me. I can take care of everything. And they realized for the first time that Jesus performed a miracle for each one of them. They missed the point. You have to go through the sword. Now, Jesus never, ever asks from anyone when they're not prepared. He looked for faith. Oh, he looked for it. It wasn't just faith that was lacking in the leaders, but he said he never found faith in Israel. No faith. The whole people condemned him in various degrees. In Decapolis, they said, get out of here, go away, we don't want you here. <laughs> Believe in him who is sent. What signs do you work, they asked him. And Jesus is patient. Before your eyes I created bread. Moses didn't give it. My father gives the true bread. Give us always this bread. They're thinking of food, loaves, fish. Abraham was dead. After Jesus died, he went to the realm of the dead. They all walked away from him, from he who walked on water. He multiplied loaves, raised people from the dead. Lord, to whom shall we go? All that is in me must die. 
that isn't Jesus. So we see, and we'll see tomorrow, Jesus die to teach us how to die to ourselves. His life is one long self-emptying, and I also want to be lowly. It is beautiful in people. I want to be more devoted to the poor, utterly detached from the things of this earth. Jesus never spoke about how good food was. He was meek. He ran from Herod, you know. He was meek before Herod. I have to be meeker than I am. He was obedient. All the silent years of obedience, always trying to do the will of someone else. The worst thing you can do is your own will. How can I be more obedient? Obedience is always to the divine will. Driving your car, stopping at a stoplight, going to the store. Whatever it is you do, it's always obedience to the divine will. I must be more, be more conscious of the divine will. Jesus made a wedding present of 150 gallons of first-class wine. How can I be more generous to others in what I do for them? The generosity of Christ. I want to be my generosity. He was so generous. He was asked to cure someone. Then they died. He went beyond the cure and he raised from the dead. He was strong. Let your answer be yes, yes, or no, no. Decide that this or that will happen, never maybe. He was always in complete control. He stormed into the temple area and the money changers and turned over the tables and went to the poor selling the turtle doves. And he said, take them out. They weren't afraid of the cords and the whips because one is always more powerful when they're right. To be right, to know you're right. Jesus was gentle always. Once Peter was with Jesus, and Jesus wanted to get out, and Peter as well, and so many people crowding around them, and Jesus said, somebody touched me, and Peter says, somebody touched you? What's, what? what? Some, hundreds of people around here. No, no, Jesus, not like that. And a little lady came up and said, I touched you. And a great eagle bent down to pick up that little dove to immortality. He laid his hands upon the little children. Their angels behold the face of God, he said. He was gentle. All of this is from the perspective of the realm of the spirit. He was kind. He doesn't pull his feet up from the Magdalene. How cruel and self-efficient the Pharisee was. He wouldn't let her touch him. The woman taken in adultery was framed. We know that. Very convenient. They went and found somebody. Has no man condemned you? Jesus said, neither do I. Just don't do it again. To the Samaritan woman, yeah, the one husband you have now is not your husband. Poor girl, you were victimized. What a sympathetic voice. Can I be more kind? A mentality that makes one more kind. Every king is a threat to another king. I don't want anything for myself. If I can, I want even less. Pleasantness. Jesus was pleasant. Always when you find him, remember Peter in the temple tax. Peter comes busting in. That man out there said you didn't pay the temple tax. There's always one who throws it in. I suppose your master isn't the kind to pay the temple tax. Oh, yeah. 
does the son pay in his own house? Peter, the worst, world's worst fisherman, every time we see him, he hasn't caught a stinking thing. But always more pleasant is Jesus. Uh, throw the net on the other side, Pete. He was lovable. Why didn't the Pharisees love him? How can I be less like the Pharisees who see in every single person some fault or flaw? Jesus is lovable because he is love. Even in the lowest degree of degradation, a reed in his hand, a crown of thorns on his head, does he say the least word against them? How can I make myself so lovable? Prayerful. Jesus would always be off praying, standing with his arms held up to his Father. How can I be a more prayerful person? I can never have enough of that. Jesus was social. The rules of politeness, knowing what to do and how to do it. It's not only because of part of the rich, but knowing how to do it. To have and engage in conversation that makes people at ease. Jesus was patient all his life. How can I be more patient? He was merciful. How can I be more merciful? He had empathy, which means to feel the tone of a person. And it's different with every single person we meet. The right thing to say at each time. After he raised the little girl from the dead, he doesn't give a gigantic sermon. He says, give her something to eat. Apparently, the little girls who are raised from the dead are always hungry. The master is over in the marketplace. Mary ups and runs to the marketplace. Jesus says, where have you laid him in the tomb? Martha, the perfect hostess. No, Lord, don't go in. He stinketh. Lazarus, come out. What does my Lord say? Sermon? Everybody's agog. Everybody came out to see this. Let him free. How can I be more like Jesus? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, most loving and affectionate Father, it is through your beloved Son that we know your love, your tenderness, your compassion, the intimacy that you desire with each one of us, Open our minds and our hearts never to be afraid to know you as you really are. Never to put an obstacle between ourselves and that love that you have offered to us through Christ. We ask this through the intercession of the most blessed Virgin Mary, the Mother of God, the Queen of the Angels. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Thank you.